By the Waters of Paradise by Francis Marion Crawford Part 1 I remember my childhood very distinctly. I do not think that the fact argues a good memory, for I have never been clever at learning words by heart, in prose or rhyme, so that I believe my remembrance of events depends much more upon the events themselves than upon my possessing any special facility for recalling them. Perhaps I am too imaginative, and the earliest impressions I received were of a kind to stimulate the imagination abnormally. A long series of little misfortunes, so connected with each other as to suggest a sort of weird fatality, so worked upon my melancholy temperament when I was a boy, that before I was of age, I sincerely believed myself to be under a curse, and not only myself, but my whole family, and every individual who bore my name. I was born in the old place where my father, and his father, and all his predecessors had been born, beyond the memory of man. It is a very old house, and the greater part of it was originally a castle, strongly fortified, and surrounded by a deep moat supplied with abundant water from the hills by a hidden aqueduct. Many of the fortifications have been destroyed, and the moat has been filled up. The water from the aqueduct supplies great fountains, and runs down into huge oblong basins in the terraced gardens, one below the other, each surrounded by a broad pavement of marble between the water and the flower beds. The waste surplus finally escapes through an artificial grotto, some thirty yards long, into a stream flowing down through the park to the meadows beyond, and thence to the distant river. The buildings were extended a little, and greatly altered, more than two hundred years ago, in the time of Charles the Second. But since then, little has been done to improve them, though they have been kept in fairly good repair, according to our fortunes. In the gardens there are terraces and huge hedges of box and evergreen, some of which used to be clipped into shapes of animals in the Italian style. I can remember when I was a lad how I used to try to make out what the trees were cut to represent, and how I used to appeal for explanations to Judith, my Welsh nurse. She dealt in a strange mythology of her own, and peopled the gardens with griffins, dragons, good genii and bad, and filled my mind with them at the same time. My nursery window afforded a view of the great fountains at the head of the upper basin, and on moonlit nights the Welsh women would hold me up to the glass and bid me look at the mist and spray rising into mysterious shapes, moving mystically in the white light like living things. It's the woman of the water, she used to say, and sometimes she would threaten that if I did not go to sleep, the woman of the water would steal up to the high window and carry me away in her wet arms. The place was gloomy. The broad basins of water and the tall evergreen hedges gave it a funereal look, and the damp stained marble causeways by the pools might have been made of tombstones. The gray and weather-beaten walls and towers without, the dark and massively furnished rooms within, the deep, mysterious recesses and the heavy curtains all affected my spirits. I was silent and sad from my childhood. There was a great clock tower above, from which the hours rang dismally during the day, and tolled like a knell in the dead of night. There was no light nor life in the house, for my mother was a helpless invalid, and my father had grown melancholy in his long task of caring for her. He was a thin, dark man, with sad eyes, kind, I think, but silent and unhappy. Next to my mother, I believe he loved me better than anything on earth, for he took immense pains and trouble in teaching me, and what he taught me I have never forgotten. Perhaps it was his only amusement, and that may be the reason why I had no nursery governess or teacher of any kind while he lived. I used to be taken to see my mother every day, and sometimes twice a day, for an hour at a time. Then I sat upon a little stool near her feet, and she would ask me what I had been doing, and what I wanted to do. I dare say she saw already the seeds of a profound melancholy in my nature, for she looked at me always with a sad smile, and kissed me with a sigh when I was taken away. One night, when I was just six years old, I lay awake in the nursery. The door was not quite shut, and the Welsh nurse was sitting sewing in the next room. Suddenly I heard her groan, and say in a strange voice, One, two, one, two. I was frightened and I jumped up and ran to the door, barefooted as I was. "'What is it, Judith?' I cried, clinging to her skirts. I can remember the look in her strange, dark eyes as she answered. "'One, two leaden coffins fallen from the ceiling,' she crooned, working herself in her chair. "'One, two, a light coffin and a heavy coffin 
falling to the floor. Then she seemed to notice me, and she took me back to bed and sang me to sleep with a queer old Welsh song. I do not know how it was, but the impression got hold of me that she had meant that my father and mother were going to die very soon. They died in the very room where she had been sitting that night. It was a great room, my day nursery, full of sun when there was any, and when the days were dark it was the most cheerful place in the house. My mother grew rapidly worse, and I was transferred to another part of the building to make place for her. They thought my nursery was gayer for her, I suppose, but she could not live. She was beautiful when she was dead, and I cried bitterly. The light one, the light one, the heavy one to come, crooned the Welsh woman, and she was right. My father took the room after my mother was gone, and day by day he grew thinner and paler and sadder. The heavy one, the heavy one, all of lead, moaned my nurse one night in December, standing still just as she was going to take away the light after putting me to bed. Then she took me up again and wrapped me in a little gown and led me away to my father's room. She knocked, but no one answered. She opened the door, and we found him in his easy chair before the fire, very white, quite dead. So I was alone with the Welsh woman, till strange people came and relations whom I had never seen, and then I heard them saying that I must be taken away to some more cheerful place. They were kind people, and I will not believe that they were kind only because I was to be very rich when I grew to be a man. The world never seemed to be a very bad place for me, nor all the people to be miserable sinners, even when I was most melancholy. I do not remember that anyone ever did me any great injustice, nor that I was ever oppressed or ill-treated in any way, even by the boys at school. I was sad, I suppose, because my childhood was so gloomy, and later because I was unlucky in everything I undertook, till I finally believed I was pursued by fate, and I used to dream that the old Welsh nurse and the woman of the water between them had vowed to pursue me to my end. But my natural disposition should have been cheerful, as I have often thought. Among the lads of my age I was never last, or even among the last, in anything, but I was never first. If I trained for a race, I was sure to sprain my ankle on the day when I was to run. If I pulled an oar with others, my oar was sure to break. If I competed for a prize, some unforeseen accident prevented my winning it at the last moment. Nothing to which I put my hand succeeded, and I got the reputation of being unlucky, until my companions felt it was always safe to bet against me, no matter what the appearances might be. I became discouraged and listless in everything. I gave up the idea of competing for any distinction at the university, comforting myself with the thought that I could not fail in the examination for the ordinary degree. The day before the examination began, I fell ill, and when at last I recovered, after a narrow escape from death, I turned my back upon Oxford and went down alone to visit the old place where I had been born, feeble in health and profoundly disgusted and discouraged. I was twenty-one years of age, master of myself and of my fortune, but so deeply had the long chain of small unlucky circumstances affected me that I thought seriously of shutting myself up from the world to live the life of a hermit and to die as soon as possible. Death seemed the only cheerful possibility in my existence, and my thoughts soon dwelt upon it altogether. I had never shown any wish to return to my own home since I had been taken away as a little boy, and no one had ever pressed me to do so. The place had been kept in order, after a fashion, and did not seem to have suffered during the fifteen years or more of my absence. Nothing earthly could affect those old gray walls that had fought the elements for so many centuries. The garden was more wild than I remembered it. The marble causeways about the pool looked more yellow and damp than of old, and the whole place at first looked smaller. It was not until I had wandered about the house and grounds for many hours that I realized the huge size of the home where I was to live in solitude. Then I began to delight in it, and my resolution to live alone grew stronger. The people had turned out to welcome me, of course, and I tried to recognize the changed faces of the old gardener and the old housekeeper, and to call them by name. My old nurse I knew at once. She had grown very gray since she heard the coffins fall in the nursery fifteen years before, but her strange eyes were the same, 
and the look in them woke all my old memories. She went over the house with me. And how is the woman of the water? I asked, trying to laugh a little. Does she still play in the moonlight? She is hungry, answered a Welsh woman in a low voice. Hungry? Then we will feed her, I laughed. But old Judith turned very pale and looked at me strangely. Feed her. Aye, you will feed her well, she muttered, glancing behind her at the ancient housekeeper who tottered after us with feeble steps through the halls and passages. I did not think much of her words. She had always talked oddly, as Welsh women will, and though I was very melancholy, I am sure I was not superstitious, and I was certainly not timid. Only, as if in a far-off dream, I seemed to see her standing with the light in her hand and muttering, the heavy one, all of lead, and then leading a little boy through the long corridors to see his father lying dead in a great easy chair before a smoldering fire. So we went over the house, and I chose the rooms where I would live, and the servants I had brought with me ordered and arranged everything, and I had no more trouble. I did not care what they did, provided I was left in peace and was not expected to give directions, for I was more listless than ever owing to the effects of my illness at college. I dined in solitary state, and the melancholy grandeur of the vast old dining room pleased me. Then I went to the room I had selected for my study, and sat down in a deep chair under a bright light, to think, or to let my thoughts meander through labyrinths of their own choosing, utterly indifferent to the course they might take. The tall windows of the room opened to the level of the ground upon the terrace at the head of the garden. It was in the end of July, and everything was open, for the weather was warm. As I sat alone, I heard the unceasing splash of the great fountains, and I fell to thinking of the woman of the water. I rose and went out into the still night, and sat down upon a seat on the terrace between two gigantic Italian flower pots. The air was deliciously soft and sweet with the smell of the flowers, and the garden was more congenial to me than the house. Sad people always like running water and the sound of it at night though I cannot tell why. I sat and listened in the gloom, for it was dark below, and the pale moon had not yet climbed over the hills in front of me, though the air all above was light with their rising beams. Slowly the white halo in the eastern sky ascended in an arch above the wooded crests, making the outlines of the mountains more intensely black by contrast, as though the head of some great white saint were rising from behind a screen in a vast cathedral, throwing misty glories from below. I longed to see the moon herself, and I tried to reckon the seconds before she must appear. Then she sprang up quickly, and in a moment more hung round and perfect in the sky. I gazed at her, and then at the floating spray of the tall fountains, and down at the pools where the water lilies were rocking softly in their sleep on the velvet surface of the moonlit water. Just then a great swan floated out silently into the midst of the basin, and wreathed his long neck, catching the water in his broad bill and scattering showers of diamonds around him. Suddenly, as I gazed, something came between me and the light. I looked up instantly. Between me and the round disk of the moon rose a luminous face of a woman, with great strange eyes, and a woman's mouth, full and soft, but not smiling, hooded in black, staring at me as I sat still upon my bench. She was close to me, so close that I could have touched her with my hand but I was transfixed and helpless. She stood still for a moment, but her expression did not change. Then she passed swiftly away, and my hair stood up on my head while the cold breeze from her white dress was wafted to my temples as she moved. The moonlight, shining through the tossing spray of the fountain, made traceries of shadow on the gleaming folds of her garments. In an instant she was gone, and I was alone. I was strangely shaken by the vision, and some time passed before I could rise to my feet, for I was still weak from my illness, and the sight that I had seen would have startled anyone. I did not reason with myself, for I was certain that I had looked on the unearthly, and no argument could have destroyed that belief. At last I got up and stood unsteadily, gazing in the direction which I thought the face had gone, but there was nothing to be seen, nothing but the broad paths, the tall, dark, evergreen hedges the tossing water of the fountains, and the smooth pool below. I fell back upon the seat, 
and recalled the face I had seen. Strange to say, now that the first impression had passed, there was nothing startling in the recollection. On the contrary, I felt that I was fascinated by the face, and would give anything to see it again. I could retrace the beautiful straight features, the long, dark eyes, and the wonderful mouth most exactly in my mind. And when I had reconstructed every detail from memory, I knew that the whole was beautiful, and that I should love a woman with such a face. I wonder whether she's the woman of the water, I said to myself. Then, rising once more, I wandered down the garden, descending one short flight of steps after another, from terrace to terrace by the edge of the marble basins, through the shadow and through the moonlight, and I crossed the water by the rustic bridge above the artificial grotto, and climbed slowly up again to the highest terrace by the other side. The air seemed sweeter, and I was very calm, so that I think I smiled to myself as I walked, as though a new happiness had come to me. The woman's face seemed always before me, and the thought of it gave me an unwanted thrill of pleasure unlike anything I had ever felt before. I turned as I reached the house, and looked back upon the scene. It had certainly changed in the short hour since I had come out, and my mood had changed with it. Just like my luck, I thought, to fall in love with a ghost. But in old times I would have sighed, and gone to bed more sad than ever at such a melancholy conclusion. Tonight I felt happy, almost for the first time in my life. The gloomy old study seemed cheerful when I went in. The old pictures on the walls smiled at me, and I sat down in my deep chair with a new and delightful sensation that I was not alone. The idea of having seen a ghost, and of feeling much the better for it, was so absurd that I laughed softly, and I took up one of the books that I had brought with me and began to read. That impression did not wear off. I slept peacefully, and in the morning I threw open my windows to the summer air and looked down at the garden, at the stretches of green and at the colored flower beds, at the circling swallows and at the bright water. A man might make a paradise at this place, I exclaimed, a man and a woman together. From that day the old castle no longer seemed gloomy, and I think I ceased to be sad. For some time, too, I began to take an interest in the place, and to try and make it more alive. I avoided my old Welsh nurse, lest she should damp my humor with some dismal prophecy, and recall my old self by bringing back memories of my dismal childhood. But what I thought of most was the ghostly figure I had seen in the garden that first night after my arrival. I went out every evening and wandered through the walks and paths, but try as I might, I did not see my vision again. At last, after many days, the memory grew more faint, and my old moody nature gradually overcame the temporary sense of lightness I had experienced. The summer turned to autumn, and I grew restless. It began to rain. The dampness pervaded the gardens, and the outer halls smelled musty like tombs. The gray sky oppressed me intolerably. I left the place as it was, and went abroad, determined to try anything which might possibly make a second break in the monotonous melancholy from which I suffered. Part 2 Most people would be struck by the utter insignificance of the small events which, after the death of my parents, influenced my life and made me unhappy. The gruesome forebodings of a Welsh nurse, which chanced to be realized by an odd coincidence of events, should not seem enough to change the nature of a child and to direct the bent of his character in after years. The little disappointments of schoolboy life, and the somewhat less childish ones of an uneventful and undistinguished academic career, should not have sufficed to turn me out at one and twenty years of age a melancholic, listless idler. Some weakness of my own character may have contributed to the result, but in a greater degree it was due to my having a reputation for bad luck. However, I will not try to analyze the causes of my state, for I should satisfy nobody, least of all myself. Still less will I attempt to explain why I felt a temporary revival of my spirits after my adventure in the garden. It is certain that I was in love with the face I had seen, and that I longed to see it again, that I gave up all hope of a second visitation, grew more sad than ever, packed up my traps, and finally went abroad. But in my dreams I went back to my home, and it always appeared to me sunny and bright, as it had looked on that summer's morning after I had seen the woman by the fountain. I went to Paris, I went farther, and wandered about Germany. I tried to amuse myself, 
and I failed miserably. With the aimless whims of an idle and useless man come all sorts of suggestions for good resolutions. One day I made up my mind that I would go and bury myself in a German university for a time, and live simply like a poor student. I started with the intention of going to Leipzig, determined to stay there until some event should direct my life or change my humor, or make an end of me altogether. The express train stopped at some station of which I did not know the name. It was dusk on a winter's afternoon, and I peered through the thick glass from my seat. Suddenly, another train came gliding in from the opposite direction and stopped alongside of ours. I looked at the carriage, which chanced to be abreast of mine, and idly read the black letters painted on a white board, swinging from the brass handrail. Berlin, Cologne, Paris. Then I looked up at the window above. I started violently, and the cold perspiration broke out on my forehead. In the dim light, not six feet from where I sat, I saw the face of a woman, the face I loved, the straight, fine features, the strange eyes, the wonderful mouth, the pale skin. Her headdress was a dark veil, which seemed to be tied about her head and passed over the shoulders under her chin. As I threw down the window and knelt on the cushion seat, leaning far out to get a better view, a long whistle screamed through the station, followed by a quick series of dull clanking sounds. Then there was a slight jerk, and my train moved on. Luckily, the window was narrow, being the one over the seat, beside the door, or I believe I would have jumped out of it then and there. In an instant, the speed increased, and I was being carried swiftly away in the opposite direction from the thing I loved. For a quarter of an hour, I lay back in my place, stunned by the suddenness of the apparition. At last, one of the two other passengers, a large and gorgeous captain of the white Königsberg Cuirassiers, civilly but firmly suggested that I might shut my window, as the evening was cold. I did so with an apology, and relapsed into silence. The train ran swiftly on for a long time, and it was already beginning to lack in speed before entering another station, when I roused myself and made a sudden resolution. As the carriage stopped before the brilliantly lighted platform, I seized my belongings, saluted my fellow passengers, and got out, determined to take the first express back to Paris. This time, the circumstances of the vision had been so natural that it did not strike me that there was anything unreal about the face or about the woman to whom it belonged. I did not try to explain to myself how the face and the woman could be traveling by a fast train from Berlin to Paris on a winter's afternoon, when both were in my mind indelibly associated with the moonlight and the fountains in my old English home. I certainly would not have admitted that I had been mistaken in the dark, attributing to what I had seen a resemblance to my former vision which did not really exist. There was not the slightest doubt in my mind, and I was positively sure that I had again seen the face I loved. I did not hesitate, and in a few hours I was on my way back to Paris. I could not help reflecting on my ill luck. Wandering as I had been for many months, it might as easily have chanced that I should be traveling in the same train with that woman, instead of going the other way but my luck was destined to turn for a time. I searched Paris for several days. I dined at the principal hotels, I went to the theaters, I rode in the Bois de Boulogne in the morning, and picked up an acquaintance, whom I forced to drive with me in the afternoon. I went to Mass at the Madeleine, and I attended the services at the English church. I hung about the Louvre and Notre Dame, I went to Versailles. I spent hours in parading the Rue de Rivoli, in the neighborhood of Maurice's Corner, where foreigners pass and repass from morning till night. At last, I received an invitation to a reception at the English embassy. I went, and I found what I had sought so long. There she was, sitting by an old lady in gray satin and diamonds, who had a wrinkled but kindly face and keen gray eyes that seemed to take in everything they saw, with very little inclination to give much in return. But I did not notice the chaperone. I saw only the face that had haunted me for months, and in the excitement of the moment I walked quickly towards the pair, forgetting such a trifle as the necessity for an introduction. She was far more beautiful than I had thought, but I never doubted that it was she herself and no other. Vision or no vision before, this was the reality, and I knew it. Twice her hair had been covered, now at last I saw it, and the added beauty of its magnificence glorified the whole woman. It was rich hair, fine and abundant, golden with deep ruddy tints in it like red bronze spun fine. 
There was no ornament in it, not a rose, not a thread of gold, and I felt that it needed nothing to enhance its splendor, nothing but her pale face, her dark, strange eyes, and her heavy eyebrows. I could see that she was slender, too, but strong withal, as she sat there quietly gazing at the moving scene in the midst of the brilliant lights and the hum of perpetual conversation. I recollected the detail of introduction in time, and turned aside to look for my host. I found him at last. I begged him to present me to the two ladies, pointing them out to him at the same time. Yes, uh, by all means, uh, replied His Excellency with a pleasant smile. He evidently had no idea of my name, which was not to be wondered at. I am Lord Cangorm, I observed. Oh, by all means, answered the ambassador with the same hospitable smile. Yes, uh, the fact is, I must try to find out who they are. Such lots of people, you know. Oh, if you will present me, I will try and find out for you, I said, laughing. Ah, yes, so kind of you. Come along, said my host. We threaded the crowd, and in a few moments we stood before the two ladies. Allow me to introduce Lord Camgorn, he said. Then, adding quickly to me, Come and dine tomorrow, won't you? He glided away with his pleasant smile and disappeared in the crowd. I sat down beside the beautiful girl, conscious that the eyes of the duenna were upon me. I think we have been very near meeting before, I remarked, by way of opening the conversation. My companion turned her eyes full upon me with an air of inquiry. She evidently did not recall my face, if she had ever seen me. Really, I cannot remember, she observed, in a low and musical voice. When? In the first place, you came down from Berlin by the express ten days ago. I was going the other way, and our carriages stopped opposite each other. I saw you at the window. Yes, we came that way, but I do not remember, she hesitated. Secondly, I continued, I was sitting alone in my garden last summer, near the end of July, do you remember? You must have wandered in there through the park. You came up to the house and looked at me. Was that you? she asked in evident surprise. Then she broke into a laugh. I told everybody I had seen a ghost. There had never been any Cairngorms in the place since the memory of man. We left the next day and never heard that you had come there. Indeed, I did not know the castle belonged to you. Where were you staying? I asked. Where? Why, with my aunt, where I always stay. She's your neighbor, since it is you. I, I beg your pardon, but, but then, is your aunt Lady Bluebell? I did not quite catch. Don't be afraid. She is amazingly deaf. Yes, she is the relict of my beloved uncle, the 16th or 17th Baron Bluebell. I forget exactly how many of them there have been. And I... Do you know who I am? She laughed, well knowing that I did not. No, I answered frankly. I have not the least idea. I asked to be introduced because I recognized you. Perhaps, perhaps you are a Miss Bluebell? Considering that you are a neighbor, I will tell you who I am, she answered. No, I am of the tribe of Bluebells, but my name is Lamas, and I have been given to understand that I was christened Margaret. Being a floral family, they call me Daisy. A dreadful American man once told me that my aunt was a bluebell, and that I was a harebell, with two L's and an E, because my hair is so thick. I warn you so that you may avoid making such a bad pun. Do I look like a man who makes puns? I asked, being very conscious of my melancholy face and sad looks. Miss Lamas eyed me critically. No, you have a mournful temperament. I think I can trust you, she answered. Do you think you could communicate to my aunt the fact that you are a Cairngorm and a neighbor? I'm sure she would like to know. I leaned toward the old lady, inflating my lungs for a yell. But Miss Lamas stopped me. That is not the slightest use, she remarked. You can write it on a bit of paper. She's utterly deaf. I have a pencil, I answered, but I have no paper. Would my cuff do, do you think? Oh, yes, replied Miss Lamas, with alacrity. Men often do that. I wrote on my cuff, Miss Lamas wishes me to explain that I am your neighbor, Cairngorm. Then I held out my arm before the old lady's nose. She seemed perfectly accustomed to the proceeding, put up her glasses, read the words, smiled, nodded, and addressed me in the unearthly voice peculiar to people who hear nothing. I knew your grandfather very well, she said. Then she smiled and nodded to me again, and to her niece, and relapsed into silence. "'It is all right,' remarked Miss Lamas. "'Aunt Bluebell knows she is deaf, and does not say much like the parrot. You see, she knew your grandfather. How odd that we should be neighbors! Why have we never met before?' 
If you had told me you knew my grandfather when you appeared in the garden, I should not have been in the least surprised, I answered rather irreverently. I really thought you were the ghost of the old fountain. How in the world did you come there at that hour? We were a large party, and we went out for a walk. Then we thought that we should like to see what your park was like in the moonlight, and so we trespassed. I got separated from the rest and came upon you by accident, just as I was admiring the extremely ghostly look of your house, and wondering whether anybody would ever come and live there again. It looks like the castle of Macbeth, or a scene from the opera. Do you know anybody here? Hardly a soul. Do you? No. Aunt Bluebell said it was our duty to come. It is easy for her to go out. She does not bear the burden of the conversation. I'm sorry you find it a burden, said I. Shall I go away? Miss Lamas looked at me with a sudden gravity in her beautiful eyes, and there was a sort of hesitation about the lines of her full, soft mouth. No, she said at last, quite simply, don't go away. We may like each other if you stay a little longer, and we ought to because we're neighbors in the country. I suppose I ought to have thought Miss Lamas a very odd girl. There is, indeed, a sort of Freemasonry between people who discover that they live near each other and that they ought to have known each other before. But there was a sort of unexpected frankness and simplicity in the girl's amusing manner which would have struck anyone else as being singular, to say the least of it. To me, however, it all seemed natural enough. I had dreamed of her face too long not to be utterly happy when I met her at last, and could talk to her as much as I pleased. To me, the man of ill luck in everything, the whole meeting seemed too good to be true. I felt again the strange sensation of lightness which I had experienced after I had seen her face in the garden. The great room seemed brighter. Life seemed worth living. My sluggish, melancholy blood ran faster, and filled me with a new sense of strength. I said to myself that without this woman I was but an imperfect being, but that with her I could accomplish everything to which I should set my hand. Like the great doctor, when he had thought he had cheated Mephistopheles at last, I could have cried aloud to the fleeting moment, For weil doch du bist so schön! Are you always gay? I asked suddenly. How happy you must be! The days would sometimes seem very long if I were gloomy, she answered thoughtfully. Yes, I think I find life very pleasant, and I tell it so. How can you tell life anything? I inquired. If I could catch my life and talk to it, I would abuse it prodigiously, I assure you. I dare say. You have a melancholy temper. You ought to live out of doors, dig potatoes, make hay, shoot, hunt, tumble into ditches, and come home muddy and hungry for dinner. It would be much better for you than moping in your rook tower and hating everything. It is rather lonely down there, I murmured, apologetically, feeling that Miss Lamas was quite right. Then marry and quarrel with your wife, she laughed. Anything is better than being alone. I'm a very peaceable person. I never quarrel with anybody. You can try it. You will find it quite impossible. Will you let me try? she asked, still smiling. By all means, especially if it is to be only a preliminary canter, I answered rashly. What do you mean? she inquired, turning quickly upon me. Oh, nothing. You might try my paces with a view to quarreling in the future. I cannot imagine how you are going to do it. You will have to resort to immediate and direct abuse. No, I will only say that if you do not like your life, it is your own fault. How can a man of your age talk of being melancholy, or of the hollowness of existence? Are you consumptive? Are you subject to hereditary insanity? Are you deaf like Aunt Bluebell? Are you poor like lots of people? Have you been crossed in love? Have you lost the world for a woman, or any particular woman, for the sake of the world? Are you feeble-minded, a cripple, an outcast? Are you repulsively ugly? She laughed again. Is there any reason in the world why you should not enjoy all you have got in life? No, there is no reason whatever, except that I am dreadfully unlucky, especially in small things. Then try big things just for a change, suggested Miss Lamas. Try and get married, for instance, and see how it turns out. If it turned out badly, it would be rather serious. Not half so serious as it is to abuse everything unreasonably. If abuse is your particular talent, abuse something that ought to be abused. Abuse the conservatives, or the liberals, it doesn't matter which, since they're always abusing each other. Make yourself felt by other people. You will like it if they don't. It will make a man of you. Fill your mouth with pebbles and howl at the sea if you cannot do anything else. It did Demosthenes no end of good, you know. You'll have the satisfaction of imitating a great man. Really, Miss Lamas, I think the list of innocent exercises you propose. Very well, if you don't care for that sort of thing, 
Care for some other sort of thing. Care for something or hate something. Don't be idle. Life is short, and though art may be long, plenty of noise answers nearly as well. I do care for something. I mean, somebody, I said. A woman? Then marry her. Don't hesitate. I do not know whether she would marry me, I replied. I've never asked her. Then ask her at once, answered Miss Lamas. I shall die happy if I feel I've persuaded a melancholy fellow creature to rouse himself to action. Ask her by all means and see what she says. If she does not accept you at once, she may take you the next time. Meanwhile, you will have entered the race. If you lose, there are the all-aged trial stakes and the consolation race. And plenty of selling races into the bargain. Shall I take you at your word, Miss Lamas? I hope you will, she answered. Since you yourself advise me, I will. Miss Lamas, will you do me the honor to marry me? For the first time in my life, the blood rushed to my head, and my sight swam. I cannot tell why I said it. It would be useless to try to explain the extraordinary fascination the girl exercised over me, or the still more extraordinary feeling of intimacy with her which had grown in me during that half hour. Lonely, sad, unlucky as I had been all my life, I was certainly not timid, nor even shy. But to propose to marry a woman after half an hour's acquaintance was a piece of madness of which I never believed myself capable, and of which I should never be capable again, should I be placed in the same situation. It was as though my whole being had been changed in a moment by magic, by the white magic of her nature brought into contact with mine. The blood sank back into my heart, and a moment later I found myself staring at her with anxious eyes. To my amazement, she was as calm as ever, but her beautiful mouth smiled, and there was a mischievous light in her dark brown eyes. "'Fairly caught,' she answered. "'For an individual who pretends to be listless and sad, you are not lacking in humor. I had really not the least idea what you were going to say. Wouldn't it be singularly awkward for you if I had said yes? I never saw anybody begin to practice so sharply what was preached to him, with so very little loss of time.' You probably never met a man who had dreamed of you for seven months before being introduced. No, I never did, she answered gaily. It smacks of the romantic. Perhaps you are a romantic character after all. I should think you were if I believed you. Very well, you have taken my advice, entered for a stranger's race, and lost it. Try the all-aged trial stakes. You have another cuff and a pencil. Propose to Aunt Bluebell. She would dance with astonishment, and she might recover her hearing. Part 3 That was how I first asked Margaret Lamas to be my wife, and I will agree with anyone who says that I behaved very foolishly. But I have not repented of it, and I never shall. I have long ago understood that I was out of my mind that evening, but I think my temporary insanity on that occasion has had the effect of making me a saner man ever since. Her manner turned my head, for it was so different from what I had expected. To hear this lovely creature who in my imagination was a heroine of romance, if not of tragedy. Talking familiarly and laughing readily was more than my equanimity could bear, and I lost my head as well as my heart. But when I went back to England in the spring, I went to make certain arrangements at the castle, certain changes and improvements which would be absolutely necessary. I had won the race for which I had entered myself so rashly, and we were to be married in June. Whether the change was due to the orders I had left with the gardener and the rest of the servants, or to my own state of mind, I cannot tell. At all events, the old place did not look the same to me when I opened my window on the morning after my arrival. There were the grey walls below me, and the grey turrets flanking the huge building. There were the fountains, the marble causeways, the smooth basins, the tall box hedges, the water lilies and the swans, just as of old. But there was something else there, too. Something in the air, in the water and in the greenness that I did not recognize, a light over everything by which everything was transfigured. The clock in the tower struck seven, and the strokes of the ancient bell sounded like a wedding chime. The air sang with a thrilling treble of the songbirds, with the silvery music of the plashing water, and the softer harmony of the leaves stirred by the fresh morning wind. There was a smell of new-mown hay from the distant meadows, and of blooming roses from the beds below, wafted up together to my window. I stood in the pure sunshine and drank the air and all the sounds and the odors that were in it, and I looked down at my garden and said, It is paradise, after all. 
I think the men of old were right when they called heaven a garden, and Eden a garden inhabited by one man and one woman, the earthly paradise. I turned away, wondering what had become of the gloomy memories I had always associated with my home. I tried to recall the impression of my nurse's horrible prophecy before the death of my parents, an impression which hitherto had been vivid enough. I tried to remember my old self, my dejection, my listlessness, my bad luck, my petty disappointments. I endeavored to force myself to think as I used to think, if only to satisfy myself that I had not lost my individuality. But I succeeded in none of these efforts. I was a different man, a changed being, incapable of sorrow, of ill luck, or of sadness. My life had been a dream, not evil, but infinitely gloomy and hopeless. It was now a reality, full of hope, gladness, and all manner of good. My home had been like a tomb. Today, it was paradise. My heart had been as though it had not existed. Today, it beat with strength and youth and the certainty of realized happiness. I reveled in the beauty of the world and called loveliness out of the future to enjoy it before time should bring it to me, as a traveler in the plains looks up to the mountains and already tastes the cool air through the dust of the road. Here, I thought, we will live and live for years. There we will sit by the fountain toward evening and in the deep moonlight. Down those paths we will wander together. On those benches we will rest and talk. Among those eastern hills we will ride through the soft twilight, and in the old house we will tell tales on winter nights, when the logs burn high, and the holly berries are red, and the old clock tolls out the dying year. On these old steps, in these dark passages and stately rooms, there will one day be the sound of little pattering feet, and laughing child voices will ring up to the vaults of the ancient hall. Those tiny footsteps shall not be slow and sad as mine were, nor shall the childish words be spoken in an awed whisper. No gloomy Welsh woman shall people the dusty corners with weird horrors, nor utter horrid prophecies of death and ghastly things. All shall be young and fresh and joyful and happy, and we will turn the old luck again and forget that there was ever any sadness. So I thought, as I looked out my window that morning, and for many mornings after that, and every day it all seemed more real than ever before, and much nearer. But the old nurse looked at me askance, and muttered odd sayings about the woman of the water. I cared little what she said, for I was far too happy. At last the time came near for the wedding. Lady Bluebell and all the tribe of the Bluebells, as Margaret called them, were at Bluebell Grange, where we had determined to be married in the country, and to come straight to the castle afterwards. We cared little for traveling, and not at all for a crowded ceremony at St. George's in Hanover Square, with all the tiresome formalities afterwards. I used to ride over to the Grange every day, and very often Margaret would come with her aunt and some of her cousins to the castle. I was suspicious of my own taste, and was only too glad to let her have her way about the alterations and improvements in our home. We were to be married on the 30th of July, and on the evening of the 28th, Margaret drove over with some of the Bluebell party. In the long summer twilight, we all went out into the garden. Naturally enough, Margaret and I were left to ourselves, and we wandered down by the marble basins. It is an odd coincidence, I said, that it was on this very night last year that I first saw you. Considering that it is the month of July, answered Margaret with a laugh, and that we have been here almost every day, I don't think the coincidence is so extraordinary after all. No, dear, said I, I suppose not. I don't know why it struck me. We shall very likely be here a year from today, and a year after that. The odd thing, when I think of it, is that you should be here at all. But my luck has turned. I ought not to think anything odd that happens now that I have you. It is all sure to be good. A slight change in your ideas since that remarkable performance of yours in Paris, said Margaret. Do you know, I thought you were the most extraordinary man I had ever met. And I thought you were the most charming woman I had ever seen. I naturally did not want to lose any time in frivolities. I took you at your word and followed your advice. I asked you to marry me, and this is the delightful result. What's the matter? Margaret had started suddenly, and her hand tightened on my arm. An old woman was coming up the path and was close to us before we saw her, for the moon had risen and was shining full in our faces. The woman turned out to be my old nurse. It's only Judith, dear. Don't be frightened, I said. Then I spoke to the Welsh woman. What are you about, Judith? Have you been feeding the woman of the water? Aye, when the clock strikes, Willie, 
My lord, I mean, muttered the old creature, drawing aside to let us pass, and fixing her strange eyes on Margaret's face. What does she mean? asked Margaret when we had gone by. Nothing, darling. The old thing is mildly crazy, but she's a good soul. We went on in silence for a few moments, and came to the rustic bridge just above the artificial grotto through which the water ran out into the park, dark and swift in its narrow channel. We stopped and leaned on the wooden rail. The moon was now behind us, and shone full upon the long vista of basins and on the huge walls and towers of the castle above. "'How proud you ought to be of such a grand old place,' said Margaret softly. "'It is yours now, darling,' I answered. "'You have as good a right to love it as I. But I only love it because you are to live in it, dear.' Her hand stole out and lay on mine, and we were both silent. Just then the clock began to strike, far off in the tower. I counted. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, I looked at my watch. Twelve, thirteen, I laughed. The bell went on striking. The old clock has gone crazy, like Judith, I exclaimed. Still it went on, note after note ringing out monotonously through the still air. We leaned over the rail, instinctively looking in the direction whence the sound came. On and on it went. I counted nearly a hundred, out of sheer curiosity, for I understood that something had broken, and that the thing was running itself down. Suddenly there was a crack as of breaking wood, a cry, and a heavy splash. And I was alone, clinging to the broken end of the rail of the rustic bridge. I did not think I hesitated while my pulse beat twice. I sprang clear of the bridge into the black rushing water, dived to the bottom, came up again with empty hands, turned and swam downward through the grotto, into the thick darkness, plunging and diving at every stroke, striking my head and hands against jagged stones and sharp corners, clutching at last something in my fingers, and dragging it up with all my might. I spoke, I cried aloud, but there was no answer. I was alone in the pitchy darkness with my burden, and the house was five hundred yards away. Struggling still, I felt the ground beneath my feet, I saw a ray of moonlight, the grotto widened, and the deep water became a broad and shallow brook as I stumbled over the stones and at last laid Margaret's body on the bank in the park beyond. "'Aye, Willie, as the clock struck,' said the voice of Judith, the Welsh nurse, as she bent down and looked at the white face. The old woman must have turned back and followed us, seen the accident, and slipped out by the lower gate of the garden. "'Aye,' she groaned. You have fed the woman of the water this night, Willie, while the clock was striking. I scarcely heard her as I knelt beside the lifeless body of the woman I loved, chafing the white, wet temples and gazing wildly into the wide, staring eyes. I remember only the first returning look of consciousness, the first heaving breath, the first movement of those dear hands stretching out towards me. That is not much of a story, you say. It's the story of my life, that is all. It is not pretend to be anything else. Old Judith says my luck turned on that summer's night, while I was struggling in the water to save all that was worth living for. A month later there was a stone bridge above the grotto, and Margaret and I stood on it and looked up at the moonlit castle, as we had done once before, and as we have done many times since. For all those things happened ten years ago last summer, and this is the tenth Christmas Eve we have spent together by the roaring logs in the old hall, talking of old times, and every year there are more old times to talk of. There are curly-headed boys, too, with red-gold hair and dark brown eyes like their mother's, and a little Margaret, with solemn black eyes like mine. Why could she not look like her mother, too, as well as the rest of them? The world is very bright at this glorious Christmas time, and perhaps there is little use in calling up the sadness of long ago, unless it be to make the jolly firelight seem more cheerful, the good wife's face look gladder, and to give the children's laughter a merrier ring, by contrast with all that is gone. Perhaps, too, some sad-faced, listless, melancholy youth, who feels that the world is very hollow and that life is like a perpetual funeral service, just as I used to feel myself, may take courage from my example, and having found the woman of his heart, ask her to marry him after half an hour's acquaintance. But, on the whole, I would not advise any man to marry, for the simple reason that no man will ever find a wife like mine, and being obliged to go farther, he will necessarily fare worse. My wife has done miracles, but I will not assert that any other woman is able to follow her example. Margaret always said that the old place was beautiful, and that I ought to be proud of it. I dare say she's right. 
she has even more imagination than I. But I have a good answer and a plain one, which is this, that all the beauty of the castle comes from her. She has breathed upon it all, as the children blow upon the cold glass window panes in winter, and as their warm breath crystallizes into landscapes from fairyland, full of exquisite shapes and traceries upon the blank surface. So her spirit has transformed every gray stone of the old towers, every ancient tree and hedge in the gardens, every thought in my once melancholy self. All that was old is young, and all that was sad is glad, and I am the gladdest of all. Whatever heaven may be, there is no earthly paradise without woman, nor is there anywhere a place so desolate, so dreary, so unutterably miserable, that a woman cannot make it seem heaven to the man she loves and who loves her. I hear certain cynics laugh and cry that all that has been said before. Do not laugh, my good cynic. You are too small a man to laugh at such a great thing as love. Prayers have been said before now by many, and perhaps you say yours too. I do not think they lose anything by being repeated, nor you by repeating them. You say that the world is bitter and full of the waters of bitterness. Love, and so live that you may be loved. The world will turn sweet for you, and you...